we were kids, we were taught to fight back to protect ourselves. Protect ourselves from neighborhood bullies, our friends, and or enemies who might cause us harm. Some governments use violence to conquer smaller nations, while others use violence to protect their sovereignty. Since the inception of life, violence has been synonymous with our world's evolution. Gandhi and Martin Luther King used nonviolence as a weapon, but other philosophers and leaders called self-defense by any means necessary, not only logical, but intelligent. Statistics may prove that we are now living in the most peaceable times in our species' existence. And judging by our tumultuous past, that may be true. But has the clock reset? And this time around, instead of Romans, European settlers, and mobsters, is modern violent crime spearheaded by our youth? According to the CDC, violence has declined since 1994. But the crisis is still very much alive and remains the leading cause of death among youth aged 10 to 24. Can we stop the senseless trend of violence that kills thousands of innocent victims each and every year? Can we reprogram the minds of robotic killers? Killers who have converted our neighborhoods into an insensitive battlefield. And what are the key elements that power this seemingly unstoppable force? Good evening. I'm Tony Perkins, born and raised in Jersey City. Growing up, I've seen this city go through numerous transformations. Some good, some bad. But the love that I have for this city has diminished through the years due to the trend of violence and disrespect that seems to be the norm, not only in Jersey City, but around the world. We have all been guilty of behaviors deemed detrimental to ourselves and the community, and mistakes do happen. Conflict is sometimes unavoidable. No one is perfect. I try to identify warning signs to somehow pinpoint how we lost more peaceful times and graduated to absolute madness. Growing up, there was always fighting, and sometimes it even got deadly. But those were few and far between. The strong family structure of those days would come into effect, resolving differences and bringing forth normalcy. This violent journey has been fueled by social ills, such as poverty, neglect, miseducation, and drugs. With youth violence now leading the charge, no one feels safe anymore. It, it ain't just about the um, the aggression that we see in the box, and it's also about the discipline. You know, all these kids in here, man, they listen to me. I talk to them. I mentor them. You know, I go to school for them. I saw you in school going to see one of the, one of the kids. You know, so so I mean, it's, it's it's deeper than boxing. Boxing is deeper than just fighting. You know, but no, this is outlet for them to come in here and get energy out. You know, uh, uh, not to associate with those on the street corner. You know, give them give them an outlet, something else to do. Violence has always been the center of controversy when it comes to our youth. How should they be exposed? And what should we teach them about it? Everything is taught, and violence is no exception. Parental discipline could very well be the first introduction of violence to our youth. From the simple hand spanking, to the switch, the belt, or even the dreaded extension cord. And here's something that's unpopular, especially among black people. Stop beating the hell out of your kids. I know y'all don't want to hear that, but we got to talk about it. If you hit a child to solve a problem, that's how a child learns, and they, they learn it well, and then they, it becomes part of their immediate 
So that, that's why sometimes it's not really a thought process. It's the thought is they learn it so much over time since they're so young. Discipline, discipline in us was real of also priority. You know, I'm talking about you just obey your parents. You got a little whipping on punishment. Or you did bad in school, you got a little whipping on punishment. And it was okay. Because that made us 60s and 70 babies, the men that we are today. We believe in belt first, foot first, fist first. And then people say, it didn't hurt me. The jury is still out on that. In some cases, you can use nonviolence to avoid dangerous conflict. But in other cases, your ability to protect yourself could be the difference between life and death. People think that they need to take justice, you know, exact justice on their own behalf. So if, or if someone assaults, attacks one of their family members or friends, then they feel like they need to retaliate. And that leads to a cycle of violence of people cross-retaliating. Someone gets shot and then that person's uh, friends and family will then, or that person themselves will go after the person who shot them. What got you into boxing? Mm, I was, every day when I was at school, people started bothering me. And, I'm, and I was trying to stop, telling them to stop, but they wouldn't stop bothering me every day. Like, I would get bullied, I would get pushed around, and I was getting sick and tired. So, I'm like, I had to calm home and tell my parents about it, so they was like, I have to get self-defense, but I studied karate, but that didn't work for me. But then my father said, let's sign up for boxing. But can teaching our children to protect themselves perpetuate the cycle of violence? School systems are breeding grounds for conflict among youth. For centuries, we have been forced to face the bully who lives for making your time on earth a living hell. Students have to know that when they are in the class with other students, that they have to be concerned about how the other students feeling. They have to learn how to take turns. They can't be first all the time. So in order to do that, those skills you have to practice. You know, you're not born with knowing how to feel about things. You're not born with making, you know, the best decisions um, depending on what the circumstances are. So these are things that even have to be taught. I mean, how to play is a skill. You know, how to share, it's a skill. Sacrifice, gratification, it's a skill. Support, it's a skill. But for every bully, there is a victim who will eventually get fed up and seek help, defend, or retaliate with extreme vengeance. What was the one Kubrick did? Um, 2001 or whatever it was where Kubrick movie. That's what it was about, a space odyssey. I mean, they just, threatened each other and screamed at each other till somebody and then they then some fool picked up a, a something and hit something and said ah oh, I know what to do the next time we have a problem with them he cracked this guy's skull and we've been off and running from there the victim is not you or the hip-hop generation the greatest crime against humanity has been the middle passage of the transatlantic ocean of enslavement no other group has experienced children what you all have experienced. There's a self-hatred that we've talked about for decades right. that black people have in this country. We've been positioned that way, okay? So moving all the way to the new millennium, we've talked about that for a couple hundred uh, years or more, right? So moving all the way to the new millennium, we have a self-hatred and a values, a crisis values, okay? So a young black man, gunning down another black man. It's this values in crisis, it's this self-hatred thing. You know, these things, you know, people don't want to talk about these things, but at the end of the day, that's what it is. You know, when, when it's one thing to talk about a white officer gunning down a, uh, a, a black male, and we see that going on throughout the country, but we see black men gunning down each other on a regular basis. There are many ways conflicts arise within the community. We've already talked about bullying. Then we can add robbery, fights over boyfriends or girlfriends, arguments over games, and jealousy just to name a few. And sadly, they all have the potential to end in tragedy. We created a unit that concentrated on the younger, younger set of violent uh, actors, let's call them. But it didn't take the traditional look of, let's find out who did this, let's arrest them, let's get rid of them. 
but it took a slightly deeper look of let's find out who's doing this let's find out who their friends are let's find out why they're doing this who their enemies are <laughs> then once we have a better picture of the whole thing then we will gather our evidence make our arrests uh, security guard is still walking around inside the store. He has some type of weapon on him. Use caution. Gun! 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 Got it? Top story this afternoon. A nine-year-old girl accidentally shoots and kills her instructor at a shooting range in northwestern Arizona. Gun advocates will tell you that the gun is necessary for hunting, self-defense, and recreation. They will also tell you that people kill people, not guns. I'm inclined to agree because before guns appeared on the scene in 1364, humans slaughtered each other with blunt objects, their bare hands, and of course, spears, arrows, swords, and knives. Homicide rates nationally um, have been falling. The places where the homicide rates are actually uh, uncontrollable or they seem uncontrollable are some of the inner cities that have some of the strictest gun controls. So you start to look at that and you start to ask why, what's going on? So I went into those places and asked those questions of different people. And what I found over and over again was actually there's a very difference in culture. Um, it seemed to me, what I just to look at it from an overall perspective, what I found is that they'd actually taken the good guys out of the gun culture, especially in places like Chicago. I mean, it, 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 the average person can't carry um, until recently a uh, handgun in Chicago for his own, his or her own protection. It would be chaotic, and then you think about the, you know, the people that do have the guns, the possession of the, the guns or the firearms. They have children, you know, you have to, you know, teach your children, do not touch your firearm. Illegal guns are too easy for people to get their hands on. Uh, New Jersey has some of the strictest gun laws in the country. You know, the tri-state area in general has some of the strictest gun laws, but there still seems to be no shortage of guns, of illegal guns out on the street. And anything we could do to stop that flow of illegal guns or to slow it down, we'd like to do. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of these young people see guns as a status symbol. Well, I'm looking at legislation right now to make it a stiffer penalty for these guns, man. You know, it's unfortunate, and, and I'm, really, I'm really being careful with the laws that we bring forth because there's a lot of minorities that's always getting jammed up. So I want to be careful with how we move in the direction of making these laws a lot stiffer. But I'm going to be honest with you, it needs to be done because the minorities that are committing the crimes, they need to do the time for it. Uh, I mean, they're too accessible on our streets in Jersey City and in country, neighborhoods throughout the country. Uh, Unfortunately, gun accessibility is, is a, largely a federal issue. President Obama and uh, legislators throughout the country have pushed for that. Uh, we need to do more and continue to stay on top of that issue because, um, unfortunately, it only comes up every time there's uh, a, violent, uh, a youth violent issue erupts. You ran your campaign with the awareness of gun violence and uh, other safety issues. Now that you're in office, what have you learned so far? Look, uh, gang violence and uh, gun violence is uh, it's complicated issues. Um, we just hired a new public safety director who uh, ran this initiative for all of New York City. We did a national search. We settled on Jim Shea, um, who was one of the most senior people out of 30,000 sworn officers in New York City. So uh, it's complicated. There's issues as far as socioeconomic issues, poverty issues, employment issues, access to guns issues, influence issues. So there's not one aspect that's going to solve all of it. There's not one solution. You've got to really approach it in a lot of different ways. And so you got to think, focus on jobs. You've got to focus on recreation opportunities. So I'm uh, a Paru member, organization Bloods, Paru, and his neighborhood. I'm a Crip member, Crip, you know. Um, we just basically, our part in the documentary was just to show the change, the mental change of people who've been living one type of way for so long, you know, and, and the growth of building a family, bringing the homies up, showing the world that this gang banging ain't all negative, you feel me? Like, it's, 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 it's been misconstrued a lot by the media and, you know, different people. You know, I was fortunate. I grew up in the Bronx. Where gangs, guns, and drugs were going on. The same thing that's going on in Newark. The thing that helped me was I had a strong family, a strong religious belief, and I got into sports. I played football and baseball through college. That kept me in school. With the violence, as far as the new, in, in our community, the gangs are not the, oh, like if you took gangs out of 
the community, the violence still wouldn't stop. You know what I mean? We have to deal with the individuals, and that's what exactly. we do. You know, right. we have enough credibility in our neighborhoods to go and be able to talk sense to our homies and they don't like blow it's, us off. It's about changing. You know what I mean? Exactly. Violence and guns is not a, it's not ethnicity based and race based. It's not a genetic thing is what I'm saying. Right. Okay. okay. Many people would argue that Al Capone invented the drive-by shooting. Right. That the right. drive-by shooting was created during prohibition when there were many um, uh, whites in this country who were out of work, needed to feed their families, needed to move you know, their neighborhoods forward and what they determine moving forward means. And those men and women, mostly men, of course, decided that there was something out there that people wanted that was prohibited, that was illegal, and they, and they decided during prohibition, this is how I was going to move you know, my, my life forward, and that is running alcohol. Not running guns, not running drugs, right. but running alcohol. Since its inception, the impact of the gun has been horrifying. It has decided wars, it's been used to terrorize, rob, and now that it has become the weapon of choice for our youth, we must all act with an extreme sense of urgency. There's a higher chance you end up in the criminal justice system, and a far higher chance that you are the victim of a violent crime. I had about 50 bullets sent to me. By the grace of God, none of them hit me, but my best friend in the world, Valant Johnson, was taken away from me. And I was so hurt at the loss of his life that I didn't even take knowledge of the fact that I still had mine. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to carry and deliver the news back to a, 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 a hurt mom that your son left with me, but it's because of me that he ain't coming back. Mm -hmm. It's too many guns, it's like bubble gum. It's too many. And I told him, I said, you have all this technology, drones and all kinds of things. Why can't you put a damn thing in that, put that, that light pole right there that go off when somebody comes past with a gun? This is an outrageous crisis that our whole community needs to come around. When Hassan called me and asked, could they come and start this here, those two young men were alive to show you how bad it has gotten. These young men were killed since we agreed to have this here. So this is not some promotion. Nowadays, the youth, they have no respect for others. A lot of the youth do not have respect for others. Um, and again, discipline comes from home. A lot of the parents, uh, they're unstable, single parent homes. Not to say that that's a, you know, an issue, um, because there are a lot of good single parents that are raising children, and they're doing a very good job. However, when you're coming from a broken home, and it's hard in that household, and lack of discipline is coming from the household, it becomes, you know, really hard. You see, so a lot of times when we pick up guns, and we point guns, and we shoot guns, we only understand what is going on between the person that has the gun and the person is being shot at. We don't understand the pain that goes on with mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. There are households being destroyed. You're not just killing a man, you're killing a family. These are all kids, all over the state, all over Chicago. This is what's happening right here. And they ain't get a chance and live to do nothing. They gunned down, powers of be ain't doing nothing. Now they want to get out and try to do something because it's election time right now. At the election time, you know what I'm saying? Kids will def definitely be, uh, again, um, just out there feeling for themselves. This is Chicago right here. You got this is where the president comes from. This is where all the top politicians, everything at. And you can tell me we can't do nothing together to help these kids out. Um, I, feel, I feel like our, we have to as a, as a, as a collective, as a, as a country, as a people, as a community, like really say, hey, 
this is what we want to give our youth. We want to give them opportunities. We want to give them love. We want to give them uh, um, chances to dream and, and like pursue their dreams, education, you know, and support. A report that was released by the University of Chicago's Crime Lab shows that the social cost of gun violence in Chicago alone has reached a staggering $2.5 billion a year. That's $1 million for every crime-related gunshot wound. $1 million. That's $2,500 per Chicago household. We are in a state of emergency. We use a, a mapping software, a geographical mapping, mapping software, and it really creates like pinpoints of every homicide in the state. And then we look at it statistically to see where those homicides are concentrated because it, it, it's determined by where they are in relation to the, their neighboring areas, how, whether it's called a hot spot or not. So we know that um, there are about 20, New Jersey has over 600 municipalities, but in the top 20 account for the vast majority of homicides. Crime you know, often is correlated to issues that are happening um, beyond that individual. So sometimes there's really employment issues. You know, if you think about people leaving the prison system and re-entering society here in Jersey City, if you're not providing those people opportunities, you know, sometimes they have payments, child support payments, they have bills themselves, they have, um, that they have to, a court issued, that they have to uh, fulfill obligations there. So what tends to happen is if you're not giving people opportunities to make an honest living, right, then they re-enter the paths that, that put them in that situation in the first place. Man, people, you know, they come from out of the prison system, they, they are almost have no chance, you know, it's like, I mean, they do have a chance and I hope they keep hope, but society makes it so difficult. You know, um, you gotta tie it into jobs, like I said earlier, you gotta tie it into second chance programs, you gotta tie it into summer opportunities, you gotta tie it into recreation opportunities, you gotta tie it into the fact that, you know, some of the parenting issues when you have uh, teenagers having children, um, you know, there's an education component to somebody explaining to them that if you have a child at 16 or 15 years old, what that does for the long-term prospects of your life. You got young people having babies that have no experience. One, in having babies, and two, in life experience at all. So you can't teach one. You know, the kids are really raising themselves now. There, there are a lot of variables, and, 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 and a big part of each thing, variable, is that we failed to provide oversight. So if in our community we said, well, I'm not running for public office, I'm not going to the PTA meeting, I don't feel like I'm too tired, I'm going to get my nails and get my weave tightened up. If we have given off the things that we should be accountable for and responsible for to others to handle, they will handle it in the way that they see fit. And it's not always the best for our children. So our children are feeling left, they're feeling lost, they're feeling rejected because other people are handling them in the way that they feel. You follow me? So we have to take back our community. We have to occupy our classrooms. We have to occupy the school, occupy the stores, see what's happening, see how people are feeling uh, and treating our young people. And what are, what are we actually willing to do to create better community? And we have to do it. The other problem we have is that I'm not letting the other folks off the hook here, believe me. We have been ripped off. There's a, a, a study that I was talking to you about called the Croson study. The study is about whether or not minorities in Jersey City have been discriminated against, or in the terms of the study, is there a disparity between how the city spends and where the city spends its money. Jersey City spends millions of dollars a year, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, in goods and services. The study was about do black and Hispanic and, and, and Asian people get their share of that money. Well, in 800 pages, the answer is absolutely not. Sometimes it's so bad, there are certain years when we don't get any of the money. The whites get it all. And we need to change that because our problem down here isn't employment. That's a part of it. It's the lack of wealth. We spent, because of uh, George Bush's invasion and occupation of Iraq, I mean, three to six trillion dollars. Can you imagine what would have happened if we had voted 
even part of that money to this country. I mean, and it's not even on the table. No one even discusses it because it's con not considered like a something that's possible because people, the Republicans won't support it. Right. So, but if, if we did, things would just be so dramatically different in this country. I mean, we'd have um, all kinds of programs to help youth develop better. New Jersey spends $1 billion a year on correction. It costs so little to have an after-school program. It costs so little to do a mentoring program. These are not things that cost a lot of money, and there are people who would volunteer and do it for free. We have to say that our priorities are to stop violence before we deal with the problem after it's at the end when we're dealing with people who are shot, killed, maimed, hurt. That's not acceptable. We can't let people tell us there's no money. There's money. The question is, how are you going to use your money? Are you going to use it to stop the violence, or are you going to use it to deal with the problem after you've allowed it to fester, to grow, and to do nothing with it? That's the question. Our children are suffering. Me being a mother of five children, a single parent, and a mother of a 19-year-old young black man and a 20-year-old young black man. Trust me, I know, and I live in a hood in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Our children are suffering. We already know, our children know organization because they have found a way to become Bloods, Crips, and Latin Kings. We really need a movement started to rid the society of, 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 of the gun scourge. You know, it ain't gonna happen on the congressional floor, you know, not even on the presidential pulpit. It, 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 it's, gotta, it's gotta be a movement. It's gotta be people tired of this. There will be no shortage of niggas. <laughs> niggas is In the world of entertainment, rap artists have felt the brunt of the blame because their recordings mirror the conditions and themes of their environment. Young people gravitate more to hip hop because it closely resembles their culture and life experiences. But some artists are very young and too immature to realize that there is a difference between artistic compositions and flat out nonsense. So now the debate becomes a war involving one's moral compass, common decency, and the First Amendment. Uh, at the time, you know, I, I, we had been through all this stuff with Don Imus, you know, saying what he said about the Rutgers basketball team, and, you know, I think it slipped out his mouth for that, uh, you know, uh, basically, rap, rappers do it, why can't I, you know, and, and basically saying that, you know, rap made me do it, and, and gangster rap made me do it, and I thought about uh, the old Flip Wilson, uh, when he used to say the devil made me do it, you know. Let 100,000 flowers blossom. I think that we have to be responsible, but we also have to provide outlets for other kinds of points of view, for other ideas to come about. I felt like people could blame the whole, all the world's problems on gangster rap, you know. Uh, Palestine, Israel, it's because of gangster rap, you know what I mean? It's like it comes to, it, it just gets absurd that people can find this taboo in our society and hang all their ill feelings or woes or, you know, the reason the world is messed up because of gangster rap. Hip hop has always been political. We first learned about racial profiling from N.W.A. So this is not something new. This is not a publicity stunt. We come from the streets. We come from the same ills and social ills that are affecting our community. You know what? I was watching a documentary online, and this is when I, got, I gained a lot of respect and wise intelligence. He broke down uh, the 60s riot, right? He broke down the 60s riot, and he was talking about what happened during the 60s and what were you listening to at that time. The type of music.
music that they were listening to, even though they were college dropouts, they were more educated and they were more aware and more conscious. They had more self value back then than the children do now. Hip hop changing from positive to negative was not a consequence of history. How do we know? 1967, Kerner Commission report on urban disorder. When black people said, yo, we're tired of this system. You know what I mean? This system is oppressing us. So we rebelled against the system. We burned things. We said, yo, we, we had enough. He did his little report on what caused these riots. He said, what caused these riots? He said it was young children who started these riots. And what was motivated, what motivating them was a high self-esteem and an enhanced racial pride. But all of it, man, is a cultural thing. We got to use the music because a lot of the, lot of the, you know, things that they do of negativity, you know, it's the culture, it's the music, it's the way they dress, it's the way they eat. And I think we have to. I know us growing up, possibly in the '80s in high school, we had a lot of things to reinforce consciousness. Public Enemy. We had the Nation of Islam with Minister Farrakhan on tour. Uh, we had X Clan, KRS One, Rakim, and now we have you know, others that, are, that I don't want to name, but we have others that are feeding them negativity, so we have to find creative ways that's attractive to combat that. He took it to 1992, you know what I'm saying, when self-destruction came out. And when Rodney King got beat down, how it was black youth that was out there tearing some stuff up. Right? Then he fast-forwarded to my man who got shot in New York 40 times. And he said, what was the one song playing on the radio at that time? Make it like a lollipop. Don't Nobody do nothing. Nobody respond to nothing. See, everybody else got a blueprint to go by, you know, on, on, on strengthening they self. You feel me? We ain't got no blueprint, in my opinion. You know, it becomes a trust issue. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you just, you don't just know anybody. Because you, you never know. You could... Be in a room with a whole bunch of niggas and just cause we black, that don't mean we friends. I'm gonna make a statement here that a lot of people are gonna disagree with. I think that the very term nigger that our children have adopted is part of the problem. If you think of yourself as that, then that's what you'll be. I heard a kid on, the, on a bus about a week or so behind me listening to something and he's and it was one of these rap records where you said nigga every other word and he said but i'm a smart nigga that's a contradiction in terms you can't be a smart nigga crack that nigga smack that nigga security rush me like arrest that nigga in 1967 when the riots happened he saw that the self-esteem and the racial pride was fueling this so he said how do i bring that down so that they will not riot. And what he did, he flooded the airways with ex black exploitation movies. Nigga Charlie and the return of Nigga Charlie. These were movies. Hip hop didn't start calling people niggas. If you think you're a nigga, you ain't very smart. Because some d comedian told you that. After all the struggles that your people went through to make you a man and a woman, and you decide that what you want to be is a nigga, so badly that you've allowed everybody else to co-opt the word. Well, honestly, those things have always existed in our communities. It's just now, with technology, people are able to see it more. I think now there has been more light shown on it as far as like with the iPhones and everybody's taking camera pictures, but these things always existed in our communities. And as far as eradicating it, I think the main factor is education. Education is needed. They're mimicking something. It's a different, a mentality is a thinking process. When you mimic something, you see it and you just want to be it. You know, like if you sit back and rehearse saying something all day, it's like a ritual. It's your belief. And that's what they do. They pump that stuff into these kids' head and they believe it. Lawyer tells me I could be facing 10. I know you smell me in the unbreaking wind. But I think that through the creation of music, our young people can find not just a, a way to rap, 
but a way to use their voice and a way to order their voice so that they get better results for their own life. Because as the as uh, as they create the music, we talk about what that's like. We talk about Eric Garner. We talk about Michael Brown. We talk about Ramali Graham. And then you find out that young people have had experiences and they get a chance to share and, and think about, well, was there anything that I could have done differently? I think that using music, looking at what we're creating, the impact that it can have on someone else, maybe it can save someone else's life. I think that that's helping to drive the young people to make better music. Nowadays, I feel like kids are exposed to any and everything immediately. The world is moving so quickly, and that's why I think it's really important for children to have positive mentors and role models. Um, you know, I write about boys searching for father figures and about families that struggle but find a way to survive. In my view, it's not simply the hip hop artists. It's, and this is part of the larger racist infrastructure that's really global, where certain hip hop artists by, uh, are championed and promoted and given the contracts by the larger parent organizations, okay? But the fact of the matter is that when we wanna talk about uh, uh, accountability, um, you know the lyrics, the lyrics and the music. The lyrics and the music um, promote black on black violence. Sometimes that explicit expression is recorded and mass distributed for all to hear. But should we blame the hip hop artists, or even movies, video games, and other forms of expression? Film is art imitating life. How could you only aim it at youth? It would be crazier than it actually is now if we made these things from a youthful perspective because we wouldn't even be thinking when we do things. There'd be no thing to it. Like right now what you have as far as gang culture exploding on the East Coast, there's no, uh, there's no lineage, there's no uh, past blood spill to the point that they've grown connected to that actual set. Regardlessly, it, it's, it's a choice. It's like they took video games like Decepticons and Autobots and turned them into gangs in the past, right? You know, so when, in, in youth culture, they want something to be a part of. They create their own versions of cool and they go after them. Back in 2004, a lot of people would say that hip hop sort of glorifies gun violence and gang activity and the violence that we see going on in the community. PoliticalSwagger.com and Political Swagger Foundation, I found it because I know firsthand the power of hip hop and the power of this generation to be used as a means for social change. It ain't gotta all be positive, you know what I'm saying? You know, because at the end of the day, it is entertainment, you know what I'm saying? So you do want to be entertained with some of the things that you're listening to, right? Right. right. So even Karen Swan understands this. Right. But, however, I'd be willing to, I guarantee if you were to change the status or to change the direction or even mix it up, because see, there was a time when you had a variety. You could choose if you wanted to listen to some gangster music or not. Mm -hmm. You could choose if you wanted to listen to some real hip hop or not. You could choose if you wanted to listen to some party music or not. You had a choice. But in the context of violence, rap music, movies, mass media, and even guns themselves, are merely the byproduct of a human behavior that has registered beyond comprehension. When young people are presented with that critical life altering choice of using violence to solve problems versus verbal mediation, the consequences of making the choice to use violence can be devastating for all involved. Kids just don't have no curfews. They can just be outside anytime. Like my little cousin, my little cousin was was 14 years old. He got killed at a, at a house party. The basics of level, it has to happen in the household more. You know, it really has to happen. You know, it, it's got to have the village too. But if the village isn't there, you know, it has to happen in the household, you know. And, um, and, 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 the, and the positive men in those communities got to, you know, it's unfortunately our struggle is from the cradle to the grave, unfortunately. So the guy who has one kid, who he's mentoring, he may have to take on 10. It was just a lesson learned. But Weaver says this wasn't the first time he played it. Before he was caught, he and his friends had attacked random people on several occasions. But what are these young people really thinking? What goes through his or her mind when they make that crucial choice of picking up a gun or a knife? 
Uh, being an African-American male in, in the public school system, I see all angles of, of, of it is. I think it's a lack of knowledge of self, a lack of historical perspective. Um, there's a lot of safe self-hatred within their race, a lot of self-hatred within themselves. And a lot of people join gangs for three reasons, power, achievement, and affiliation. So a lot of these kids um, meet up with a lot of guys that are like-minded, that don't have the people to zero in on them to make sure that they're going in the right direction. You know Brother Perkins as well as the young man right here, we've had some people in our lives that zeroed in on us, and that's why we're here today. It has to happen in the home, in the home and then they have to sanction it so that people outside the home can help the, mm -hmm. you know, the kid. And then the kid has to realize you know, that there's a light on the other side on, at the end of that tunnel. But if you go left, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's almost as simple as going left and right. And if the left is, is uh, more seductive, than doing the right thing, because doing the right thing is hard. It is a hard choice to do what's right. It's always easy to go the quick and easy route. We must go back to our history and teach our children to love themselves so that they can love others. That means that you are committed to doing whatever is expected for you to do and forever grow. Whether we are here in a building, whether we're on a field trip, whether we're at the state house, whether we're at the White House, you are supposed to act the same way when you're in Jersey City or if you're on train or Washington, D.C. It's very important for Forever Girls to be available so that we can target the girls that are going through these things every day, that are going through uh, the youth domestic violence, the teen pregnancy, the, um, the young addicted children. We seem to think that marijuana is not a big issue, but we have children that are addicted to marijuana and, and are doing different things. So Forever Girls is a program that, that definitely needs to be here so we can target a lot of our at-risk youth here in Jersey City, Hudson County. We have anger, we have jealousy, we have envy, we have the most dangerous thing called ego. And at and, and different days and different times, those emotions guide our directions. And when those emotions guide your a direction, 99.9% .9 of the time, you make the wrong decision. This generation now, kids are not really scared of anything. It is to show them what the consequences of making the wrong decisions, living in that two by whatever cell and having to sleep with a person and, and go to the bathroom in front of a person and, and not have your freedom every day. This corrections officer at New Jersey's Clinton Female Detention Center gives us a perspective from inside of the jail. Her identity and voice is concealed for her own protection. The followers, and a lot of them, um, I noticed the young girls, they don't think for themselves, they don't um, move on their own. They, the followers, they're young and, and just young. But what makes them like, get into it? I think just being a part of something. I think they fall for that okie doke of um, we're family. You know what they say, but please, I, the, and that's part of the reason why I say it's a joke because they don't send those girls money. We a family, we take care of you. But what happens is when you get to talk to these kids, and uh, I get to talk to all of them, the gangbangers won't talk to you. The drug dealers won't talk to you, but they'll talk to me. They want to get their feelings of expressions out. They want people to know that they want to do something constructive in their life, just don't know how to get there. When you realize that there's a, when there's programs where kids realize that there's somewhere to go, and it, when people realize that there's someone who cares about them, someone who loves them, that it changes, it, can, it changes their lives. And so those programs are immensely important, especially in a world where people are trying to get by, where families are at times broken up or scattered. For, the, for a child to be able to feel like somebody cares and is willing to nurture them and allow them to reach their potential is a very powerful thing. Jersey City, New Jersey, the youth crime problem has been a high priority for the city's new mayor, Stephen Fuller. He has campaigned on making improvements in this area and has made great strides. But the road is paved with unfortunate setbacks, hard work, and uncertainty. The area of the city that's been neglected is the south side of the city. There's no question about that. So you talk about Ward F, Ward A, okay. um, predominantly is going to be our focus because 
in order to get, you know, when, when I go into the communities there, they say, look, you know, we want to have things other than a liquor store in the corner or a corner store. We want to have a coffee shop. We want to have places to go. In order for that to happen, investment to come to that area of the city, the first thing is you got to make sure that the streets are safe. When we took over, the mayor and I, in July, there was a rash of shootings and homicides in the south and west of this city. And we had to engage in some policing that we called it sweeps. We sent many uniform officers in, flooded neighborhoods with, pol with uniform police, a little more heavy handed than we might like on a daily basis. But the bottom line was that we had to make sure those shootings ended. And then once we got those shootings tamped down and some arrests made and stopped the back and forth, what I call the Hatfields and the McCoys type of shootings, once we got that in hand, then we were able to pull back, go to a more visible presence start to go deeper into these things. So our first priority is always stopping the violence and ensuring the safety of the residents of Jersey City. The lack of resources has to be the most frustrating part about helping young people. And it seems like something horrible happens every day. But contrary to popular belief, good work is being done across the country. Educators, youth programs, volunteers, community leaders and activists are on high alert. We can't be silos to ourselves, you know. We have to get rid of, as I said earlier, the whole mindset that somebody needs to give you an invitation to your own struggle, you know. <laughs> if you see something, that means you were invited. If your eyes allowed you to read it, well, no matter where you read it, no matter if it's an hour or a second before it's going to happen, if you have the ability to be part of it, then you take that ability and be part of it. We need collective and coordinated intervention. We need help from everybody, you know, together, collectively. But like I was telling the other folks right now in Newark, you know, people's individual ambition is has outweighed our collective uh, responsibility. And I think that's all over the, the country, wherever we are in these, in these cities, in these urban centers. All of the resources and money that come in these centers uh, is channeled to small groups of individuals who walk away with the money and the resources and is never used for the collective good of the people in this community. We can't be backbiting because, first of all, there's enough work for everyone. There's enough work for everyone, so we don't have, we shouldn't have to be sitting up here and trying to knock this one or, or knock that one. One of the biggest things, particularly in the black community, and I must say this, is there's no unity. Multimedia has been used in Newark as a tool to expose social ills, hoping that the mirror effect can help change negative behavior. I'm, I'm hoping I can continue to shine some sort of uh, a mirror on it, a light on it. I'm hoping that when I'm needed, and if there is a way I can help you know, them with what they're trying to do, which is what I've, what I've tried to do so far, and also that um, I can even help, help, if necessary, change some of the policies around it so that the right, the right laws are in place so that people get the benefit of what the country has to offer. That's what I'm hoping. You know. I'm a Jersey boy, man. Uh, you know, I was born in New York, but I grew up only a few miles from here in Elizabeth, New Jersey on the streets of Elizabeth. My parents got worried I was going to become a juvenile delinquent. They moved to the suburbs, Maplewood, right on the border. Uh, so, you know, this is coming home for me. Uh, my mother worked here. She was a professor at uh, uh, Newark Law School. Uh, my parents were involved, uh, both of them, in the civil rights movement and in uh, the first campaign here um, for an African-American mayor, uh, Gibson, you know, in 1970, first African-American mayor in the Northeast. And then, you know, just uh, in terms of my own film career, you know, look, I never, when we went and did Banging in Little Rock for HBO in 1993, I didn't think, you know, we'd get initiated by being thrown in the middle of a drive-by with the Bloods and the Crips and the Gangster Disciples and the Vice Lords and all that craziness. We did Slam in a prison in D.C. We did Thug Life in D.C. It just happened. The producers of this award-winning crime reality show has kept the pressure on by courageously venturing into the troubled city of Chicago. CNN's Chicagoland has succeeded in bringing the problems to the forefront and reaching young people. But it's going to take constant pressure and resources to reverse these horrific trends that plague the Windy City. We're in a state of emergency. A state of emergency is a government decree that a particular situation requires the implementation of pre-arranged resources on a large scale. However, we do not and we cannot afford to wait for the government 
to decree that this situation is a state of emergency and requires national action. But the help keeps coming. Chicago natives Kanye West and Common have since launched programs to help employ young people. Common uses his celebrity to speak out against violence, hoping to reach receptive ears. Well, I'm just, you know, I love that, 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 that the, the mission is to resolve it. That's the great thing. And uh, I mean, I think communication is, is the best way to, to resolution, man. Like if you could just, you know, if you think about it, it happens in relationships, you know, um, it happens with, with, with our family members. You gotta just say, like once you're able to, to sit down with somebody and, and hear their side of things, you understand them more. So I think, you know, it's great that they're getting the chance to sit down and talk and we gotta keep that communication flowing. Longtime Jersey City resident Bobby Stewart has been at the forefront of providing young people with constructive things to do. We need more safe haven um, programs in the community here in Jersey City to get them off the streets, um, to give them, to introduce them to uh, uh, new avenues uh, to go down. Um, not knocking, you know, basketball or football, they're all great. Um, but we need to expand as far as activities, and I feel that chess being one of them is, is, is vital. Um, in Europe, uh, chess is m mandated um, with so many um, families over there that you have to learn this game of chess. Jerry, we had parents when we were coming up. Yeah. We had a whole bunch of support, family support. How important is it for parent, pa parent participation? To oh, man, I mean... Kids? It's very important. That's one of the things that's a challenge for me um, uh, to try to get the parents more involved with their education. Uh, one of the things that we have, we have the 21st Century Grant, which we focus on science, mathematics, and technology. And part of the grant is parent participation. So we, we struggle with that a little bit because I think it's, you know, babies having babies and they don't understand the importance of it. So if they understood that, you know, it's the only way out is education and, and, and understand a desperate need to educate the youth and so they can make this good decisions so they could, you know, be productive citizens. The parents absolutely got to be involved. I mean, I, I go by the old model, take the village and raise a child. I mean, growing around, growing up in this neighborhood, it wasn't just my parents, it was other parents that could weigh in on how I behave and everything else. We got to get back to that. Like, if you want to stay in boxing, you got to keep up your grades and stuff. Nine times nine? I mean, he helps out. He helps other kids, you know, so, so, Kids learn, kids is more receptive to other kids. When they see him doing it, they want to emulate, so they do it. And you know, that's how we do, we emulate. Like right now, we get caught up. The fad, we get caught up in fads. Everybody got their pants hanging down, pants hanging. We got on the wall, no sagging pants. We ain't seen no pants sagging in here. There's no sagging pants, we ain't playing none of that, you know. He's making me do extra work. Cause you're not listening, you're not listening, you're not doing the In this world, we live in a you take orders from people. You're gonna learn how to work at other people's places. How you supposed to work? How you want to work? You hear me? Take it out. Sit up. Sit up. So here we give them an outlet, man. You know, and I'm like a big brother to them. I'm like a father to some of them, man. You know, and, and uh, I'm their mentor. When we were kids, we were taught to fight back to protect ourselves. Protect ourselves from neighborhood bullies, our friends, and or enemies who might cause us harm. Some governments use violence to conquer smaller nations, while others use violence to protect their sovereignty. Since the inception of life, violence has been synonymous with our world's evolution. Gandhi and Martin Luther King
When we were kids, we were taught to fight back to protect ourselves. Protect ourselves from neighborhood bullies, our friends, and or enemies who might cause us harm. Some governments use violence to conquer smaller nations, while others use violence to protect their sovereignty. Since the inception of life, violence has been synonymous with our world's evolution. Gandhi and Martin Luther King used nonviolence as a weapon, but other philosophers and leaders called self-defense by any means necessary, not only logical, but intelligent. Statistics may prove that we are now living in the most peaceable times in our species' existence. And judging by our tumultuous past, that may be true. But has the clock reset? And this time around, instead of Romans, European settlers, and mobsters, is modern violent crime spearheaded by our youth? According to the CDC, violence has declined since 1994. But the crisis is still very much alive and remains the leading cause of death among youth aged 10 to 24. Can we stop the senseless trend of violence that kills thousands of innocent victims each and every year?